How's it going, Internet? I'm Tim Stedman, and this is Get Psyched with Tim Stedman. The only show on the Internet where we find out if the frequency of your I need a break moments during class predicts just how many times you'll hit that snooze button in the morning. Today, we're diving into Science Practice 3, Data Interpretation. Before we get into it, if you've liked these reviews so far, be sure to subscribe to the channel and make sure to get a hold of your Get Psyched to Score 5 review guide, which can be found in the description box. And I know, I know, I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but I promise you I'm not doing this to be annoying, I'm only doing it because I care. Alright, now with that boring stuff out of the way, time to get to the fun stuff talking about statistics and psychology. So believe it or not, statistics are the backbone of data interpretation in psychology. It allows us to transform raw data into meaningful insights and scientifically sound conclusions. Without statistics, we're just swimming in numbers without truly understanding what they tell us about human behavior. So how about we get started by talking about measures of central tendency. These are statistics I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Central tendency gives us a snapshot of the middle or averages of a data set. That's right, we're talking about the mean, median, and mode. So the mean is your average score calculated by adding all scores and dividing by the number of scores. The median is the middle score when all scores are arranged in order. And the mode, well that's just going to be the score that appears most frequently. You know, things that you learned in fifth grade math. Identifying the mean, median, and mode will help us understand how data is distributed. Data distributions are going to tell us how data points spread out or cluster around central values, revealing deeper insights into psychological research. Now when it comes to data distribution, it can be positively skewed, negatively skewed, a normal curve, or something known as bimodal distribution, and lucky you, we're going to be talking about all of them. First we're going to talk about positively skewed curves. In a positively skewed distribution, most of the data clusters towards the lower end of the scale with the tail stretching out towards the higher numbers. When we have a positively skewed distribution, it means that the mean is typically greater than the median, which is in turn greater than the mode. On the flip side, negatively skewed curves are where data points are concentrated toward the higher end and the tail extends toward the lower end with the outliers on the left dragging down the mean more than the median or mode. So what happens when the mean, median, and mode are equal? Well, if that's the case, we have a normal curve. A normal curve is a bell-shaped distribution that represents a perfectly symmetrical spread of data points with most values clustering around the mean and fewer occurring as you move away in either direction. A normal curve distribution is very important in psychology because many psychological traits, such as IQ or standardized test scores, tend to naturally follow this pattern. Now how about we take a look at each of these curves. What is something that they have in common? Well, all three forms of distributions only have one peak in data. And we're going to see that that is not always the case. In fact, in some research, we see bimodal distribution occur, which is when the data shows two distinct peaks rather than just one. And how exactly does this happen? Well, bimodal distributions generally appear in psychological data where there are two different groups responding to the same survey or test differently. For instance, Imagine a scenario where two age groups respond to questionnaires about technology usage. Younger respondents might show high usage rates, while older respondents show another peak at lower usage, resulting in two distinct peaks in the overall data. Now, understanding different data distributions sets the stage for our next critical topic, variability in data. Now, variability provides insights into how spread out or closely clustered our data points are around the central value, which is crucial for interpreting the data's consistency and reliability. The three measures of variability we are going to learn about is going to be the range, percentile rank, and standard deviation. First up, we have the range, which is just the difference between the highest and lowest values in our data set. The range gives us a quick snapshot of the data spread, but it doesn't tell us much about the distribution between the extremes. The percentile rank indicates the percentage of scores in a data set that a particular score is greater than or equal to. For example, if your score is in the 90th percentile on a test, you scored higher than 90% of your peers on that test. Next up, we have the standard of deviation, 
which is a more comprehensive measure that tells us how much the values in a data set deviate from the mean. A low standard of deviation means the data points are clustered closely around the mean, while a high standard deviation means the data points are spread out over a wider range. When looking at data, what exactly does the standard of deviation tell us? Well, we have the empirical rule, or the 68.95.99.7 rule, which will explain just that for us. This rule provides a pretty solid shortcut in understanding how data is distributed in a normal curve. It states that about 68% of the data falls within one standard deviation of the mean. If we expand our view to include two standard deviations from the mean, we capture about 95% of the data. And if we go even further to three standard deviations from the mean, we find that 99.7% of the data is represented. Regression towards the mean is a statistical phenomenon where extreme scores or behaviors tend to return towards the average on subsequent measures. This happens because extraordinarily high or low scores often include a component of chance that is unlikely to repeat itself. For example, imagine a student scores exceptionally high on a particularly difficult test much higher than their usual performance. It's likely that their score on the next similar test will be closer to the average performance, illustrating regression towards the mean. The initial high score might have been influenced by factors like favorable exam topics or simply luck, which aren't guaranteed to happen every time. Now that we have all the important terms for variability and central tendency, how about we take a look at some hypothetical psychological data to see if we can identify some of the concepts we just talked about. So here on the screen is our hypothetical set of data that is exploring stress levels across different age groups. If you're following along with the review guide and are feeling a bit bold, pause the video to see if you can analyze the data on your own. And if you're not feeling it, feel free to continue on with the video. Just know I am judging you a little bit. Shame. Now looking at our data set, we can see that we have a table with average stress levels on a scale from zero to 10, where 10 represents maximum stress across various age groups, along with the standard deviation for each group. These measures give us insights into both the average experience of stress and how much individual variation there is within each age group. We also have a table showing us individual reported stress levels for the 18 to 25 age group. So how about we start off by double checking the average stress levels of the 18 to 25 age group by using the provided data. So how about we get started with the mean, we take the 15 reported stress levels from members of the 18 to 25 age group and we add them together. Now, if my calculations are correct, the sum of our 15 reported stress levels would equal 109.9. Now, once we've got that number down, we divide it by the number of scores, which is 15, and crunching the numbers, we end up with a mean score of 7.3. All right, so moving on to the median. So let's start off by taking all of our reported stress levels from the 18 to 25 group and place them in numerical order. Once we do that, we search for the piece of data that is in the middle, which in this specific case would be 7.2. And finally, the mode. And to find the mode, we just need to search for the score that appears most frequently in our reported data. And in this case, it looks like that is going to be a mode of 7.0. All right, so we've got central tendency down. So how about now we take a look at measures of variability in our data set on stress levels across age groups. Beginning with the range, remember, the range gives us a quick snapshot of the spread between the highest and lowest scores in our data. For our 18 to 25 age group, to find the range, we simply subtract the smallest reported stress level of 6.5 from the highest reported stress level of 8.4, giving us a range of 1.9. So what exactly is our takeaway here? Well, we have a relatively small range, which is going to indicate that while there are variations in stress level among individuals, these variations aren't extremely wide. This can be pretty insightful when considering interventions or support tailored to this specific age group as their stress levels cluster around a specific segment of our scale. Now let's take a look at the standard deviation and what exactly that means for our research. What exactly does this 0.6 tell us about the variability of stress levels among individuals in the 18 to 25 age group? Well, this statistic is actually quite revealing because it quantifies the extent of deviation from the average stress level. A standard deviation of 0.6 is actually pretty low, which means that the stress levels reported by most individuals in the 18 to 25 age group are quite consistent and don't vary widely. Essentially, most stress levels cluster tightly around our calculated mean of 7.3, with most values falling between 6.7 and 7.8.
This tight clustering tells us that while stress exists within this demographic, it does so within a narrow range that doesn't see extreme highs or lows. For psychologists, this suggests that interventions designed for stress management for this age group can be more uniform as the variance in stress levels isn't too extreme. Now, understanding that most individuals' stress levels are close to the mean allows health professionals to predict and plan more effectively. It helps in designing programs that address the common stress factors impacting this group. And while measures of central tendency and variability do a great job at describing and summarizing data, what do we do if we want to use our data to make predictions? Well, this is where inferential statistics come into play. Unlike measures of central tendency, inferential statistics go beyond describing data by making predictions or inferences about a larger population. This branch of statistics uses probability to make judgments about the likelihood that an observed relationship is reflective of the broader population. While we talked about the purpose of correlational studies in Science Practice 2, in Science Practice 3, we're going to talk about how to analyze this correlational data and apply it to psychological concepts. So we are going to see that correlational data can be positive or negative. A positive correlation means that as one variable increases, the other one does as well. For example, hours spent studying and test scores typically have a positive correlation. The more you study, the better your test scores tend to be. On the other hand, a negative correlation means that as one variable increases, the other variable decreases. An example here could be the number of hours spent playing video games and academic performance. As gaming hours go up, grades tend to go down. When analyzing correlational data, we are given a correlational coefficient. A correlational coefficient is just a numerical measure that quantifies the strength and direction of a correlational relationship between two variables. The direction of the relationship is represented by a positive or negative symbol, and the strength of the relationship is represented with how close, regardless of positive or negative symbol, the value is to the number one. So a correlational coefficient of negative 0.87 actually represents a stronger relationship than a correlational coefficient of positive 0.77. Now, just like we did with central tendency, let's take a look at some hypothetical correlational data. So remember, Questions on the AP Psych test are not only going to require an understanding of these statistics, but you also have to be able to properly interpret the data. So on the screen, we have hypothetical data from 10 students showing their average daily screen time as well as their GPA. So we can come to several conclusions from the data we are provided with. Looking at our scatter plot, we notice a downward trend. This downward trend represents a negative correlation. So as we've learned, negative correlations occur when two variables are moving in opposite directions. So we can come to the conclusion that there is a casual relationship between our two variables. We see that the more screen time seems to correlate with a lower GPA. We are also provided with a correlational coefficient of negative 0.99. The negative sign also tells us that we have a negative relationship between our variables. With a negative 0.99 coefficient, we can also come to the conclusion that this is a strong correlational relationship due to how close it is to the number one. Now, based on this information, we can conclude that there is a pretty strong negative relationship between our two variables of screen time and GPA, meaning that we can conclude that there is a chance that these two variables are closely related. Now, it is very important to remember that this is not showing us a cause and effect relationship. As we mentioned in our Science Practice 2 review, correlation does not equal causation. Looking at correlational results as a cause and effect relationship is a no-go. Otherwise, we might believe crazy things, like thinking there is a true relationship between Google searches for Batman and the number of security guards hired in Oklahoma due to the strong correlational data. Now, unless this surge in Batman searches has somehow sparked a wave of vigilantism in Oklahoma, causing the need for more security guards, it's very unlikely that there's any real link here beyond mere coincidence and chance. All right. And that concludes Science Practice 3 Data Interpretation. You can probably predict what I'm going to say next. Really make sure you understand these practices before moving on to the course content. Having a good understanding of these science practices will only make learning the course content that much easier for you. And little disclaimer, there will not be review video for Science Practice 4 for for little disclaimer for little disclaimer for for there will not be review video for little disclaimer on argumentation shin 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 shin. Greeting loyal viewers, I do apologize for the disruption in your services, but it is for a most crucial and significant announcement. I, Tim Stedman, in my boundless wisdom and unparalleled insight, 
have decreed that science practice for shall indeed receive its rightful spotlight. So, prepare yourselves for an enlightening journey through the majestic art of constructing a defensible claim supported by robust evidence. Until next time, peace.